Are you ready? Yeah. The love of this. I adore. <laughs> I absolutely. Are you ready? Yeah. It's because they're being dehumanized. It's time to take the humanity back into the center of the ring. He's right in many aspects, but it has to go deeper. We should put humanity in the center of the ring. What is the definition of humanity? Our worldview, the perfect human is Christ himself. Look to see for which of these passions you are dead and which ones you are alive to, and then you'll know how far you are alive to the world and how far you are dead to the world for the sake of truth. To hate it for the sake of truth, to hate it for the sake of what is good. Eastern Orthodox priests, they're all real people. Like he, he was like, he's like, one guy's talking about punk rock. Punk rock. The other guy's lifting heavy weights. Everyone's um, like a normal person. You can relate with the priest. Hey, dear friends, Man here. You're listening to watching The Study of Stuff. Thank you for tuning in. I have a magnificent interview for you guys today. The great father John Valdez of Death to the World. If you don't know what Death to the World is, you don't know about the zine, you don't know about the website, links in the description links down below. Check it out. You'll find out a lot more in this interview. Now, uh, we didn't go deep into his story as to whole backstory of Death to the World and the tattoo parlor with Father Turbo and all that. Buck Johnson at Counterflow did an amazing job uh, getting that story. So I'm going to include that in the show notes. Go check out that episode if you want to go deeper into the story. What we did do instead was we went uh, deeper into the reasons why there are so many punk subculture individuals turning to and looking at orthodoxy. As well as I wanted to spend a lot of time with Father John discussing unseen warfare, uh, the importance of understanding it, understanding the passions and all of that, especially in today's world, especially at this time in history when there's so many people under spiritual attack. I just wanted to give out some real quick shout outs to a couple of the viewers. Man, we've been getting a lot of messages. Thank you very much for everyone that watches, for everyone that comments. We love the comments. So if you if you, if you like something, if you don't like something, throw it in the comment box. I want to hear about it. Also, if there are any uh, moments, highlights that you really enjoy and like in any of our videos, throw the time code in the comment box. It helps us a lot. We've had a lot of stuff on the table, a lot of editing, so it does help us a lot. Big shout out to Brody Alexander. Thank you so much for helping us out. Brody Alexander. A huge shout out to Slowboy Whiteboard. A lot of your posting has been very, very helpful. Thank you for putting out some clips for us. Anyone that wants to join the party, Telegram groups in the description. See you down at the, you know, see you on the program thing. Anyways, my friends, enjoy this episode. This amazing interview with Father John Valadez, Death to the World. Okay, and we are live. Today's guest, um, I'm, I always say it, but I'm going to say it again. Very special guest. I'm super excited to have this conversation with me today is uh, Father John Valdez. Father John, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for doing the show. Thank you. It's good to be here. Good to be with you. Um, before we get started, and before I like ask you for an introduction, I just wanted to talk about something that we have in common outside of punk, outside of uh, orthodoxy. And it's um, the love of this. Let's see if I can get it on. There we go. I adore. <laughs> I absolutely adore Beatles. <laughs> and this is a stunning Beatle. Tell me a little bit about this. Yeah, I, um, well, I kind of grew up around Beatles. My dad had one when I was a kid. And um, I had one when I started dating my wife when we were courting. And we actually, after I got married, after we got married, we drove away in it. So that was our drive. We have a picture. We have a driveway just married in the, uh, on the back of the Volkswagen. Um, but awesome. when I got kids, when we had kids, um, I, we, we, I got a, a, a safer car, you know, so I, I had to get rid of the, the Volkswagen. I didn't have a garage to keep it in or anything at the time. So just recently, you know, we live in a small town now and it's there's not a lot of driving needed and so i needed a car that i could work on and 
it could be a little bit of a hobby thing. And um, mm-hmm. so I found this uh, Volkswagen that I've been working on. You know, it's always just good to work with your hands and see something, you know, that you make, be able to run and um, get you from place to place and things like that. So I've rebuilt the motor in it and and done some body work and I'll do some other things, but it's kind of my my tinkering kind of wind down thing on my days where I'm not, you know, I have one day a week where I'm really not doing services and things like that. And um, so the bug, that's the bug project day, you know. <laughs> I, I do because um, I ever since I was a kid, I, I've had a love for it. I, I remember what the show, uh, there was like a movie back in the 80s with a, a little uh, bug with the number eight written on it. I don't remember what, I don't remember the movie, but I remember being obsessed with with the Volkswagen Beetle. And yeah. uh, when I saw when I saw you posting it, I was like, oh my God. Because like one of the things about living in Mexico, they're everywhere. They're yeah, everywhere. Yeah. 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 They kept making so, them after the after the German manufacturer stopped. They kept making them in Mexico and Brazil. So yeah, so you can buy Mexican beetles, you know, and actually some of the parts like the body parts that have been welded on over the years to fix things on my car are from Mexico. They have a little Mexico stamp on them. Um, awesome. So rep in Mexico, yeah. uh, Mexico is beautiful. <laughs> for that kind of stuff. I, I love it. I love it. And, and, and I like it for a lot of the same reasons you just mentioned a, you can work on it on your own. Uh, like I, I've heard from a lot, a lot of people that have had bugs or other VWs are super easy to work on. And, uh, you know, it's kind of, there's something like pretty cool about just knowing you have a, some tools in the back or in the front and, and you're able to just like fix, fix the car in the middle of the road. It's pretty cool. I think it's awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, it's like four bolts. It's like four bolts. You can take out the engine yourself, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't think you can get more punk rock in a car than that. I think, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. Can't get more. Well, DIY. I wanted to... Exactly. Absolutely. So I wanted to start off with asking you, uh, who, who is father John, but also before you say, tell me a little bit about who father John is, who was, who was John Valadez before becoming a priest? So like a little bit about yourself pre priest and then like the transition to priest, uh, any changes? Mm. I'm sure there's plenty. Um, well, um, I, I grew up in Southern California, um, in, in a house that was divided. So I had a, I, I had my mom's house, I had my dad's house that I traded that was, I was back and forth, um, between, um, because of custody, things like that, which is pretty typical for, a for somebody in my generation. Um, but um, I, I just became really disillusioned with um, the society around me. And so that really was my gateway into punk rock. And I had a lot of friends who became who, who started listening to a bunch of different music that got me into it and things like that. And it was attractive to me because it was pointing out what I saw as kind of plastic and fake um, around me uh, that wasn't fulfilling and things like this and gave me sort of a community um, that was united in many different ways to my way of thinking and, um, friends that were there for me and things like that. And so it was attractive in that regard. Um, but in high school, I, I found some friends who, um, were in like this Christian punk scene. And so I started going to shows and listening to music and became, became a Protestant Christian, uh, during that time in high school, uh, like middle school, high school. And, um, that really put me on the path to just really diving deeper into the scripture and getting to know who Christ was and switching from a mentality that was against, um, I guess the, the gave uh, maybe a depth to my rebellion against, uh, the world. Right. Um, it was no, no longer just because of politics or economics or whatever. There was actually a, a spiritual world that opened up for me and that, that it was a real spiritual battle rather than some kind of uh, socioeconomic battle or political battle or something like that. And so that, that it became deeper um, in that respect. And um, I was going to a, a Bible study at a tattoo parlor uh, with Father Turbo, who you interviewed. Uh, he was our yeah, teacher uh-huh. at this tattoo parlor and he became orthodox and I was as a, working as, as his apprentice at the time. So I started reading into it and finding some um, old 
uh, Death to World Zines, which is which is a ministry um, that I've been blessed to take up now, but was started in the 90s. Um, by some ex-punk rockers who became Orthodox monks. And so reading those and reading the book Youth of the Apocalypse that came out of that little movement and that ministry um, really draw, drew me into the Orthodox Church. So when I walked into the, the Orthodox Church for the first time, I had like black tight jeans and spiky hair and <laughs> leather jackets and things like that. Um, and so, yeah, there was a lot of change over the years of kind of shedding all that stuff away and realizing it's not about this outward appearance anymore, but, um, yeah. but an inward work on myself, mm -hmm. you know, and mm -hmm. I was just so unsatisfied with, um, regular jobs and so drawn to the church and went to various places and monasteries, um, in, in some respects, kind of trying out my myself to see if I would enter into the monastic life or, li or, or not. I went to Alaska f a few different summers at the monastery in Spruce Island. And, um, but I couldn't really shake off the want to dedicate my life in some kind of way. I met my wife, and she's probably the biggest change that happened in my life as far as, you know, a really big inspiration for me. And um, over a while, oh, over some time or whatever, we prayed about uh, going to seminary or something like that. And at, f at first we were kind of unsure whether that was something that <clears throat> should do or not, but it came to a point where we asked our spiritual father about it and, and it ended up going in 2015 uh, or 16. Uh, yeah. Fifth end of 2015 or so we went um, over to seminary and I was ordained um, to the Holy Priesthood on my during my third year there um, in 2017, 2018, something like that. And um, when I graduated, the bishop, uh, the Metropolitan at the time, put me out here in, in a little town called Lompoc, which is a yeah. like a little town on the on the central coast of California. It's very nice. <laughs> I, I looked it up. It really is in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. It, it's kind of out of the way for most people. It's on Route 1, like Highway 1, which is a famous, you know, road to drive up and down on the coast, but it's kind of on yeah. this like off offshoot of the one where it kind of offshoots yeah. and comes back and so it's a little bit out of the way for people, but it's all surrounded by farmland and it's a small town and there's only only three streets with uh <laughs> with stop lights on them and stuff like that. So it's nice. <laughs> That's, hilarious. That's hilarious. Well, it, it, I like that you, uh, that you mentioned um, uh, making the decision with your wife and uh, how much of a, an inspiration and influence she was in the whole process of becoming a priest. Because uh, looking at everything now and myself coming out of the whole subculture uh, that we both kind of grew up in, uh, me in Toronto and you on, in, in California, Having a family, being a family member, like a a, a a patriarch to a family, is pretty punk rock nowadays. Like it's 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 like <laughs> kind of, it's kind of a, re a rebellious task. Yeah. So I kind of like that uh, that that's kind of part of your story, and like that you threw that in there because I I don't think I've heard that from a lot of priests. Mm. So I, I think it's it's wonderful and and like. Um, I, I wanted to carry on the story, and uh, so at this point, you you kind of uh, you're a priest. You've you've changed your life. Uh, a lot of things have changed for you from making the transition from the tattoo parlor, as you mentioned, with with Father Turbo. And uh, you did a great interview with uh, Buck Johnson on Counterflow. So I'm going to include that in the show notes. So I'm not going to get into too many details there because uh, you, you you really broke it down well in that interview, and it was a great interview. So um, I'm going to definitely include that in in the show notes. But um, there's definitely a pipeline between uh, the the punk world, especially the type of punk that we kind of came out of, uh, nice. going directly into to the Orthodox world. Uh, and there's mm. a, common, a lot of common um, uh, stop, stop points, one of them being Father Seraphim Rose, uh, Death mm -hmm. to the World, and, and just the whole thing in itself kind of embodies a lot of stuff that we were, um, maybe, you know, we, we thought punk was one thing, but it turned out to be another. Uh, yeah. In your opinion, what are the, what are the, what would you say about that? Like, what is the pipeline? Why is the pipeline there? And why are so many people drawn to it? I think, I think that um, the appeal is the, the otherworldliness of orthodoxy 
and the um, the life of asceticism, I think gives wow. meaning and purpose, you know? Yeah. Um, there's a lot of quote unquote asceticism in, in punk rock as far as, but it doesn't, it's not really deep, right? Like the, some, some people are vegan, some people are straight edge, some people um, dress this way, dress that way, go to these kinds of uh, shows, lace up their boots this way, et cetera, et cetera. There's all these exterior kind of rituals, right, um, that are done. But at the end of the day, um, especially in my experience, at the end of the day, it it really became the very thing that that um, it hated, you know, like, yes. and, and instead of it just became its own materialistic culture, right? And if you didn't have the right shirt or you didn't dress this way or you didn't go to these shows or whatever it may be, you weren't like in, right? There's the whole term of being a poser, right? You weren't, you weren't yeah. like considered in. So it became really what it, what it sought out hating. And that is this materialistic plastic society that's so focused on externals. Um, mm -hmm. And so its rebellion had no depth, right? At the end of the day, there's just, it's just like anything else, you know, it doesn't go very far, especially because of the nihilistic aspect of it, um, that there is no future, right? That the, the popular saying, um, there's no future and, and orthodoxy has rebellion with a future, right? It's, it's for mm -hmm. the kingdom of God. And this rebellion isn't predicated on what, where you buy your clothes or how you dress or how you put up your hair or how you diet or how you lace up your boots or any, any, anything stupid like that. It's, it's, yeah. it's about uh, an interior rebellion of the heart, right. Uh, and, and ra waging an, uh, an unseen warfare that, that is uh, found in each and every one of us. Um, and instead of turning so sharply against the world and pointing fingers so quickly, because that's very easy to do, right. Is to sit around yes. and, uh, talk about what's what what's bad going on in the world, which is not necessarily wrong, but when it is just a means of it itself, it becomes very you know redundant after a while. Um, it's it's much harder to to look inside of one's own heart and see where we also have contributed to what's going on in the world and how we have to change ourselves. You know so. Mm -hmm. I think that the appeal of asceticism, because it is how we primarily preach about this change, is what's so appealing because it is rebelling against the world um, in a way that brings spiritual grace and riches which are eternal and everlasting. Um, so I think that's the main draw, at least, at least that was for me, especially when looking at death of the world issues and seeing these these men with like long beards and hoods on and you know, these desert dwellers, uh, reading about the desert yeah. dwellers and their ascetic feats and all these kinds of things or the martyrs, of the communist yoke, you know, how they really um, fought for what was true and right against a, an entire regime that was putting their, their priests and their friends and their family and everything and, and everything they knew, the culture that they knew to death, you know, Mm -hmm. um so, so it's really incredible it's i think that's the incredible thing about it is that it it gives meaning to a rebellion you know yeah fully uh and for me uh particularly because I, I came out of that culture but also i, I was raised greek orthodox and mm -hmm. then I, I veered off for a while uh, but uh mm -hmm. when i started encountering a lot of um a lot of non Greeks, non Russians, not Serbians, uh, you know, uh, gravitating to what I thought was like, you know, like where I came from, no one knew what orthodoxy was, you know what I mean? Unless you were Greek, Russian, or, or Serbian. Mm -hmm. And then seeing all these like non, uh, whatever you want to call them, uh, converting to, to, to orthodoxy, it kind of struck me and it jarred me quite a bit. And then when I was, when I first encountered Death to the World, I was shocked. I was like, "Are we talking about the same Eastern Orthodoxy? <laughs> like, 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 is this the same thing?" Because to me, my my image wasn't that. It was like my grandfather and being in Greece and Cyprus. And then I'm looking at these images, and I'm my brain didn't know how to process it. And I and then I started mm -hmm. to like flip through, and I it started to jar me personally. Like, like I started to realize how little I knew about 
but my faith. I've repeated that many times on this mm -hmm. podcast, but I think it's an important thing for me. But what it also did is it made me think of um, a lot of the punks that got into it for the what we would think are the right reasons, which is like uh, against materialism, against consumption, like against all of that stuff. Uh, it's kind of like the end, the the final stop to like Western culture. Uh, it's kind of yeah. like the end nihilistic rot. And it reminded me of uh, Joe Strummer. Like, I'm a huge Clash fan. Mm. And Joe Strummer to me has like a special place in my heart. And if you don't mind, I'm just going to play a quick little clip of him saying something. Yeah. I think this clip, he wasn't orthodox and he had some socialist questionable ideologies, but I think for right. the right reasons again. But right. this clip, right. I think, is pretty orthodox. I don't know. what, what I want to see what you think. Are you ready? Yeah. All right, let's do it. People can change anything they want to. And that means everything in the world. People are running about following their little tracks. I am one of them. But we've all got to stop just following our own little mouse trail. People can do anything. This is something that I'm beginning to learn. People are out there doing bad things to each other. It's because they've been dehumanized. It's time to take the humanity back into the center of the ring and follow that for a time. Greed, it ain't going anywhere. They should have that in a big billboard across Times Square. So uh, what's your take on that? Yeah, I mean, he's, he's right in many aspects, but it has to go deeper, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think mm -hmm. the same is true with so many of these punk rock uh, legends. You know, like um, the, I think it's, who who was it? It was John Lydon. It was the, yeah, the singer of the, the Sex Pistols. You know, the past yeah. few years, he's been very vocal about yes. um, how the quote unquote left has, ha, has become the kind of arm of the system or whatever. And he's mm -hmm. spoken out ag against all of the things that happened during COVID and things like that. Um, maybe not all of them, but he was very vocal about certain things that had to deal with over control and things like this. And it's very interesting to see some of these punk rock idols become um, aware of what's going on, almost aware in some respects of where their movement had gone to, you know, um, yep, yep. and uh, kind of trying to turn it around you know um mm -hmm. and he i mean he's right right that he's right that there should be a billboard like that in times square and that we should but put humanity in the center of the ring but the, i guess the question would be you know what what is the definition of humanity right and yes in yes. in our worldview the perfect human is christ himself you know and yep um that's where we find our humanity the more we're like him the new adam the more we are human truly human and that's where our solution is you know because we can be we can we can be pretty virtuous people but not get very far if we're even if we're living a a a sort of virtuous life going down the rule the list of like various um i don't know uh, uh conservative things or um uh, uh, if we're just going to list of virtues or whatever and just keeping them just for virtue's sake and uh, then we're, we're still not going to get very far something needs to happen that is deeper a change a repentance needs to happen um that's mm -hmm. deeper and a and a conforming to christ um and a surrender um to that to that life right killing the old man or crucifying the old man um to become truly human a resurrected person um is really what needs to happen because what we see around us though he yes he's pointing out all of these things that are going on and they're all very true um but the hitting if if he were to hit the nail on the head he would be he would be saying that it is because of a spiritual decay right and that that's really that's really what we're experiencing it's not 
political instability. It's not overreach of corporations. It's not uh, economic instability or whatever, though all that stuff is happening for true. <laughs> true. But mm -hmm. what's the root cause of it all? It's all spiritual decay. It's all spiritual decay. Oh, that's that's um, that was beautifully said. Uh, and it, it kind of uh, segues perfectly to where I wanted to go from from this point on. I really wanted to get into uh, Unseen Warfare. Uh, the, uh, the the lecture you put out on uh, on Eknekron, by the way, great great uh, name for a podcast. I love it, okay. um, and it's a great series. I, I've put it out a couple times. Um, I've had a lot of people reaching out lately, friends of mine, people that have listened to the show that are asking me if I'm feeling uh, a massive attack lately, recently, and mm -hmm. and I, I have to say, without a shadow of a doubt, there's a definite uptick uptick. And a lot of people are saying the same thing. Mm -hmm. uh, both converts, cradle, everybody is kind of seems to be saying the same thing. And death to the world. Um, the, my take from it I'm, is the importance of, of understanding the passions, what they are, uh, which I have a hard time with, which is what big reason why I wanted you to, to, to come on. And something that I've been talking a lot with Father Turbo, but I need to understand that. I'm not... Mm -hmm. I'm trying to understand that. So if you could just segue from like death to the world and what, what it means to be to, to death to the world and segue into the unseen warfare and uh, just take it any which way you want. Repentance and confessions is definitely something I want to touch on as well. Okay. Yeah. You know, the name um, death to the world was it, it, uh, it was, it was used by the creators of the magazine to be uh, a fish hook because it's, it's a uh, it's a striking thing to read, right? Um, but on the inside of every cover, they kind of explain where they got the name from, and it's a quote from Saint Isaac of Syria, and he he basically lists all of the passions. He says, "By world, we mean all of all of these passions," and has a long list of passions, um, talking about love of riches, vanity, sexual uh, uh, passions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and then he he basically says, "Look to see with." for which um, of these passions you are dead and which ones you are alive to that live inside of you. And then you'll know how far you are alive to the world and how far you are dead to the world. Um, it's like a litmus test, right? And um, these passions, you know, I think St. Maximus, the confessor, does a great job in explaining what these passions are. You know, all the fathers do, but um, he has some great works on it. And, he basically um, describes the passions as being perversions of what we are created with. Um, that there, there, there are certain powers of of the human being um, that we are given that we use incorrectly, and this is why the church says that we're sick when we have when we have certain passions. So, for instance, if we were to talk about anger, right? Um, anger, this. Uh, intensive power was given to us in creation to be angry and abhor everything that is unjust or evil. And mm -hmm. that is for the sake of truth, right? To hate it for the sake of truth, to hate it for the sake of what is good, to separate what is good from the bad, to be zealous for uh, in preserving what is good and to hate everything that is evil. Um, but and, and that and that is an operation that we're kind of we're 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 attributing you know we're if we're protecting good from evil we're 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 safeguarding what is holy which is um, safeguarding our our love and our communion with Christ right so it has a aspect of it that is not just for ourselves right it is it is a love and and um, this is. I think I, this is be tied up in a lot of Maximus's theology um, for the sake of love, right? It's a virtue for the sake of love. But when we are angry with other people for the sake of our own selves, right? We're angry with somebody for cutting us off on the road. We're angry with somebody because we're impatient. We're angry with this. We're angry with that. A lot of that has to do with our own ego and our own expectations on the world. And so our anger in that way is, is very self-pleasing. It's selfish. It's only for the self. And that's it. So it is a power given to us, but is perverted. It's used in the wrong way. 
right? Um, and you can say the same thing um, for any of of the passions themselves. Gluttony, for instance, we are given a love and a, a and and taste buds and these kinds of things for certain kinds of food or food in general in order for us to give. You know, the fathers say, especially Saint Basil and in um, his works on creation, some of the other fathers, that the foods were given to us in paradise so that we would taste what is sweet, we would taste what is good, and give love to our creator because uh-huh. he has provided these things for us, right? And so it's something that, it, it's, it's a power of the soul that, that will end in love for God. Um, but when we use gluttony, for our own self, because we want to eat certain foods, going to be oversatiated, all these kinds of things, then we're using to gratify the self. It's only for the self, right? And so it becomes perverted. It's used in the wrong way, right? And so all of the passions um, that we talk about when they develop into passions, that is when they're really deep-seated in our life, trying to we're, we're really trying to, in the church, correct them and reorient them to how they're created to be used. You know, it's not enough to just to get rid of the passion of lust, right? A, a, wow. An attitude of chastity has to be cultivated as well. And um, um, certain kind of, certain kinds of love, uh, true love have to be have to be um, healed and things like that in relationships, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so when we're trying to root out the passions, when we're dying to ourself, dying to the old man means to die to that sick man who is uh, completely ruled um, by his passions because that's, it, it, it's, that's really the, the insidious thing about the passions themselves is that in some, in, in many ways, the world teaches us that their freedom, right? To to go after what we want is freedom. Yep. To exercise this in in orthodox um, um, understanding, and to to exercise this sickness, if you will, um, mm-hmm. use these powers in a self pleasing way, which is a perversion of of uh, of of them. Um, is freedom it's it's how we truly find out who we are it's how we find our 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 identity it's how we um you know live life to the fullest or whatever it may be but in the end they actually become uh slavery you know um yes yes uh, very very easy ones are like if we think about alcohol for instance right if somebody is becomes a full-blown alcoholic and things like this or a drug addict um then everything that they do revolves around this certain passion right it becomes Mm -hmm. a a complete slavery and Mm -hmm. and everything else begins to crumble you know and it affects everything else and but the same thing is with gluttony right i mean we're in the fast right now we're in lent and we're we're called by the church to eat certain way and when we can't get foods that we want or we don't eat at the times the church tells us not to eat and things like that, right? We get, we get irritated. We get angry. We are short-tempered, right? We get uh-huh. uh, oh, yeah. we'll say, angry, you know? <laughs> and so it, it affects our relationship. Mm-hmm. We're enslaved by it. We're so enslaved by it. And then it affects our Absolutely. relationships around us. Oh, wow. Yeah, that, there's a lot there. Um, yeah, because I wanted to talk about fasting, actually. And, and um, I heard you t- speaking about uh, the Garden of Eden, and one of the very first entry points from from the deceiver was uh, was gluttony, like creating the the, um, the whole concept of eating and eating the fruit, and and from there it kind of it's like an entry point, and uh, it also ties in well with a lot of the other things you were saying there, because I was just making mental notes as you were talking. Um, a lot of the New Age version of looking at spirituality is self-centered and it's mm-hmm. actually working on long the opposite the inversion of everything you just said is literally the other side like get what you want manifest for yourself you, you create mm-hmm. your own reality so um one of the turning points i had was when i started to rethink of the church 
uh, from the proper perspective of as a hospital. He made many references there of curing, curing these things. Uh, how do we go about doing so while we're also trying to um, combat like gluttony, like we said in the Garden of Eden, uh, and avoiding self-centeredness? What are some tactics or approaches that we can we can apply in our lives? Hmm. Well, every every passion has has its own remedy, you know, just like any sickness has its own remedy, its own prescription mm -hmm. that's given out by a hospital or by a doctor. And so um, in the book Unseen Warfare that um, St. Nicodemus um, of the Holy Mountain has revised and things like that, it's a book that actually came from the West, but was revised by some Orthodox fathers. Um, he says the first the first step is to you know recognize that we're sick. That's the first thing we have to do, right? Um, you're not going to go to the hospital uh, and seek a doctor's aid if you don't recognize that you truly are sick. And there's there's work that needs to be done. There's operations and other things that need to be done um, to do that. And then, but then after that, he says to look at the passion that is the largest passion, the one that um, occupies your mind the most, the one that is the the largest slave driver, if you will, in your life. And he says, attack that one first. And when you attack that one first with the help of a spiritual father and the various church services and prayers and things like that, then you begin to see that other things in your life start to also lose um, certain power over you or um, that their strength starts to dissipate a little bit, you know. Um, like St. John Climacus, he, he, he would say, and all the fathers agree with this and would say, you know, if you're trying to attack, attack uh, um, lust, for instance, um, but if you're a glutton and you're overstimulating your senses all the time, then you're just like throwing gas on a fire, you know. Mm -hmm. And so, if gluttony is attacked and fasting begins and um, mm -hmm. uh, a sort of temperance of the flesh begins, then then this um, hold on us of lust will start to lose its its strength, and we can fight it on a better on a, with with better tactics or better weapons or on a better battleground. You know what I mean? Um, because if we're if we're overeating all the time gluttony isn't just overeating it's overstimulation of the senses so we can be gluttons of sleep we can be gluttons um you know by scrolling on our phones we can be gluttons by overeating we can be gluttons and all sorts of things overstimulation of the senses if we're always stimulating our senses and then the body is just used to always getting whatever it craves you know yes and if there's no resistance against putting it in check, you know, then our battle against lust is going to be a very, very hard one to win, you know? Um, mm -hmm. so, so there are various tactics within the church on depending on what is the largest slave driver in our, in our life. And he, and, and so, um, in unseen warfare, and one of the first steps is to, um, to target whatever is the, biggest slave driver and begin to tear that down in our life and just work one thing after um, another as it comes, you know, because he said another temptation is to try to attack everything at once. And then we become yep. kind of burnt out and yep. we, we, we end up giving up and falling into despair because nothing's happening or, or we, we feel like we, we can't do enough to, to cure all of these things going on in our life. And, so that's another way that the devil gets us, the Father say, from the right-hand side, right? Where it looks like we're doing good. We want to do all these kinds of things. And then when we can't conquer it and we can't because it's insurmountable and it's too big, then he dashes us to the ground with despair. Yeah, actually, that's a very important one. Uh, I've experienced that uh, when I tried mm -hmm. at first uh, mm -hmm. to tackle all of them. It, it's almost like you... you Forgive me, Father, if I'm not describing this accurately. It feels like I'm thinning out my attempt 
to the point where the deceiver can kind of get in and and just like go, oh, what about this thought? And then just like drop a, mm-hmm. a little thought in my mind. Mm-hmm. I'm like, oh yeah, what about that thought? And then all of a sudden I'm off scrolling on my phone or I'm doing whatever. <laughs> and I'm, in trouble. <laughs> I, I, I'm in trouble, you yeah. know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, so I remember yeah. Father, Father Turbo said to me, like, when you go to the gym, do you do every single exercise at once? And I was like, I guess not. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And you know, it, it, the, the passions progress in, in a certain kind of manner. And this is what's so wonderful about the church and having such a, such an ancient tradition is that we have all these fathers and mothers that have already tread this path before us and have already mapped out all of the pitfalls and um, have got this down to a science, you know, the fathers, the the science of sciences, you know, um, the unseen warfare and, you know, the, they, they break uh, the development of a passion down into certain steps. And the first one is a, is a suggestion of a thought, you know, and this is where everything begins this is where everything stems from a su- suggestion of a thought. If we're able to use the Jesus prayer or use prostrations or whatever to get rid of the thought, then we haven't sinned yet. Um, but when we start to, what the father say, uh, they, the next step is coupling, which is to to align ourselves with a st- thought or communicate with a thought, right? And then then we give it some sort of life because without us entertaining it, it has really no life in and of itself. Um, yes, and yes. But then when we start to say, oh yeah, that cheeseburger on the on on the first week of the fast, that sounds really good. <laughs> you know, that that's coupling, right? That's that's beginning uh-huh. beginning the process of of uh of thinking about it, right? And then and then it will would move on to the plans of like, oh well, how can I get one? Right? How can I get <laughs> the cheeseburger? Maybe without yeah. people from my parish seeing me at the restaurant or whatever it may be, right? So then the plans yeah. start to like emerge from it. How am I going <laughs> to get this done, right? Um, yeah. And then the then the act then the act uh, could happen, right? But the father said there's always like kind of a a, a a a moment of God's grace in this time between coming up with these plans and then actually manifesting them and doing the action that there's this mm-hmm. moment where our conscience objects and we can begin to fight it, even though it's progressed all the way down to this stage, it's still fightable, right? And um, mm-hmm. we can still insert um, the right things to do, um, mainly prayer and uh, maybe calling our spiritual father or um, getting our knees praying, going to going or just directing ourselves to spiritual reading, whatever it may be, you know, um, Mm -hmm. to help to dissipate the thought. Um, But, but if we go to the next stage and we carry it out, then we're doing even more damage because it helps progress to the last stage, which is a full blown passion. That is it. It's something that becomes a habit really, right? It it attaches itself to the heart and, then it becomes even harder to fight the next time, especially if this is something we've repeated through our life. It's hard to um, to even maybe discern these these stages. Like um, if I if I'm if I'm a glutton, I just love food so much. I, it may be hard for me to to discern when the thought comes in, when I, when I started this coupling process of thinking about it, when I made the plans and when I did it, right. It might go from right. Just the thought coming in, then I go and do it. Right. It becomes so quick because it's a full blown passion, right. It's become, it has become a habit and this is when we become enslaved to it, but there's all these stages the fathers talk about, but they all begin with, with these thoughts that get, that get inserted. Um, through various means, whether they're demonic temptations or just temptations of the flesh, um, um, various things that are just pushed on us by the world around us. Um, and so, because these are the three kind of uh, enemies that Seneca Demas describes, the the world, the flesh, the devil. These are where we get our get the various things that come into our mind from the various influences um, from 
the stroking of the passions, these kinds of things from. Um, so yeah, when a thought comes in, we always have the ability to drive it away. Um, prayer, spiritual reading, going on a walk, you know, getting out of our house, you know, especially because some passions are so, um, so much done in secret, especially nowadays when we have computers in our home, we have, we can order, order anything to our home. Um, and these kinds they were so incredibly spoiled, um, that now because we have everything at our fingertips, we, we have sin at our fingertips, um, as well. And so, and so some, sometimes the shame of it that existed in the old days doesn't, doesn't exist anymore, you know? Yes. Um, yes. Yes. And so that barrier, that was a great barrier, you know, in society oh, yeah. to have, yeah. Yeah. you know, and um, it worked to our That's advantage great. in many ways. And now that barrier yeah. is totally gone. You know, you have the, yep. you have the whole concept of like the peeping Tom, right. Who um, yep. uh, was the villain that would l- look into, into windows or whatever, when girls are changing or whatever. And this was, this was considered by uh, society to be very shameful, um, yes. to be caught in this act or to do, right? Very, very shameful. Um, but now we've got, you know, all, all sorts of, all sorts of uh, peeping going on, you know, through the internet and our phones and totally. all kinds of, right? They're all over the place. It's all over the place. And, and it's not, it's look, not frowned upon. Um, but even, but even, um, talked about as a virtue in, in some circles, you know, so yes. um, that barrier is not there anymore. And so we hide in our homes and, and do a lot of sin, um, that we have at our fingertips that otherwise in other times and in other cultures, we'd be, we'd be shamed for doing it. Or at least that barrier of shame might keep us from, um, going full blown into, into the types of uh, sins that that we get ourselves entangled in in today. So, so I mean, even going out for a walk, getting out in public, going, getting a coffee somewhere, these kinds of things, um, even though they might not seem like like incredible spiritual feats to do, like they still are tactics to use to get ourselves out and about to get ourselves moving, to put our mind on something else, to focus on something else, bringing a book, sitting in a library, whatever it may be, um, to do some spiritual reading or something edifying. You know, we have to use all of these things that we can in order to help ourselves in in modern society. And that's something that Father Seraphim was big on too, right? That we live in a culture that is spiritually deficient and so we need to find anything that we can to nourish ourselves whether it be classical music or classical literature or going on a walk in the forest or finding a a place to hike or going to the beach and watching nature whatever it may be we have to we have to uh use everything every little bit to our advantage because the world is constantly just sucking and what what he said is that it makes totalitarian demands on the soul, right? Which, yeah, you know, he yes. said that in 1980, he said that in 1982 and he was complaining about the, you know, you, you go to a campground is rock music. You go here, there's rock music. He was complaining about all this kind of stuff, right? In the, in, in the late seventies, early eighties. And now it's now, you know, we've got phones and TVs everywhere and screens in our faces. So we don't want them and all kinds of stuff. Yeah. Hearing you talking about the peeping Tom, and then following following through to that thought that you just had there, that's really um, that's that's a really good point because basically it seems like what what these these things are are just like a passion driving attention like they they just grab your attention and make you like peep over here peep over there and constantly robbing your attention from participating in in God's creation and then you're mm-hmm. constantly uh, focused on fueling things that lead to the passions like you said the the three enemies uh the world the flesh and the devil and the devil uh in greek uh if i'm not mistaken means the divider the the Mm -hmm. separator the the diabolos to to separate things to separate you from Mm -hmm. god so it's like uh wow you just you really blew my mind with that comparison that's a good way of thinking about it the peeping tom we should bring shaming back to a certain degree because i mean we we now we glorify fornication we glorify all these these uh 
these things and it's uh <clears throat> it's extremely dangerous especially for fathers out there uh you know for both boys and girls you, you see i i heard you mention uh the feminization of christianity was one of the reasons why uh, you weren't drawn to certain types of christianity and the masculinity of orthodoxy uh drew you there which to me also brings it back to like the whole punk ethos but not to mm -hmm. veer too far off from the subject of um, unseen warfare yeah you blew my mind with that that was a really good way of thinking of it um the noose repentance confession um how can you tie those three things in together uh to bring it into unseen warfare like what is the importance of confession repentance and how does the noose apply to this uh, and for those that may not know what the noose is um if you can give a quick little definition yeah um the noose is a term that is sometimes translated sometimes untranslated um in spiritual texts um sometimes it, it it's a little bit hard to discern because sometimes it's translated as the heart sometimes it's translated as the intellect um but it, what it really means in the fathers no matter how it's translated is them talking about the highest um faculty of man or um the center of the soul and they in in orthodox christianity there's there's a like we had talked about the science of uh spiritual warfare along with that goes the science of of um anatomy like there's a spiritual anatomy um that the that the fathers talk about and describe there's aspects of the soul powers of the soul that they that they talk about and they describe and flush out in various um different spiritual texts um but the noose itself is the highest faculty of man it's the center of the soul it is the faculty that they say is how God create uh, uh, communicates to man, or um, where a man receives grace from God is through his his noose. And when man was first created, the noose was the director of man's entire being, and so the grace of God being in communion with with, with God, this aspect of uh, of of man's uh being this highest faculty being in communion with god all of the time drove his entire life so what he thought about how he acted how he spoke how he named the animals right and how he ate and all these kinds of things were always directed by his spiritual intuition or this uh this spiritual thai communion that he had with his creator when the fall happened that put the entirety of man in disorder and the lowest aspects of man became the driving aspects of man so the lowest aspects were those ones that we share with animals or with beasts and those are the the want to eat the want to um like their survival instincts almost um so we don't have to get too into it but kind of like survival instincts that you see animals um play out with and how man was never created to be governed by this faculty this kind of bestial faculty this is why we gravitate towards everything that we desire and want to be satiated by it and this and that because we are governed now we allow ourselves to be governed by lower faculties that we share with animals and this is why in many of the hymns or writings of the fathers they'll talk about us becoming beasts when we become uh people that are driven by passions we become like beasts um, because we're acting in this bestial mode it's a subhuman um mode and um the church is always tr trying to basically correct man's anatomy, to bring his noose to become clean, to become filled with the grace of God, to be in communion with God. And in, in doing that, um, he is able to be driven spiritually. And this is why St. Paul talks about this um the need to put the flesh into subjection so that the spirit um can be strong and um 
and be the driving force in our life. And so um, all of the aspects of the church, it's sacraments and it's ascetical life and um, and everything that is about being an Orthodox Christian is trying to um, make this spiritual faculty the to clean it, to repair it, mm-hmm. to, to mm-hmm. fill it with the grace of God and allow it to direct our life. And so mm-hmm. confession is a big part of that because imagine, imagine the noose is kind of like a mirror, right? It reflects the image of God. But over the years and through our various sins and passions, we've just slung mud on this mirror. And so the vision of God, the face of God, the reflection of him cannot be seen because there's all this dirt and grime and build up on it. Um, Mm -hmm. And confession is a way when we start to chip off or to rub away this dirt in order for the image to be more clearly seen for his face to be more visible in our life. And, um, and so the various aspects of, of the church, even fasting, like we were talking about is, is trying to change, right. To put a, if we're governed by our kind of bestial passions and, and especially by our belly, which beasts are prone to be governed by, um, the, the church is asking us to fast and to put, spiritual things above those things right so it's trying to flip us back to 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 how we are created to function um so put the spiritual life above your want to eat right and um so it's trying to correct us right to give us a good adjustment if you will and so the so repentance um and confession is a big part of that because it's really how we start to clean out um the noose to to allow god's grace and his reflection to be shined forth um from it so that we can truly um live in his image and likeness so um so yeah that's why we have confession in the church is to begin to make that distinction you know the the lord says that blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see god and this is what he's talking about um, when the, when the noose is purified, when that that mirror, mirror is cleaned, um, then we begin to see God in it and see God in our life. Wow, that's uh, that's a lot to take in. I, I like that. That's a great way of looking at it. The the dirty mirror. I, I, <laughs> I, I, that's a really really simple way of seeing it. Thank you. That was very helpful. Like you uh, you clarified some stuff. Uh, for me there, actually. You really did. Thank you so much. That Thank was God. Thank God. Absolutely. Yeah, glory to God. Glory to God. Um, mm-hmm. I'm going to just ask you one last question, and then okay. uh, we'll tie it all, all up. Um, I, well, it's more of asking for a story, story time. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I heard you mention it, uh, uh, tell the story on uh, on Buck's, uh, Buck Johnson's uh, Counterflow episode that you did. And I thought it was extremely, um, it was a beautiful story. And it was, it was very, uh, it's the, the story of St. Paisios, where he describes the, the tomato plant. And, and, and the reason why I think that's a great way to end this uh, uh, is because I know a lot of people are um, reaching out to me for whatever reason recently, um, trying to avoid answering people's questions. And I'm like, you know, talk to a priest or whatever, like, you know do my best to avoid that but i get a lot of questions and instead of uh and i, I heard buck say the same thing when you were in, and I, i'm getting that all of a sudden now and i that story is very helpful for a lot of the questions i'm getting and a lot of the questions mm-hmm. i'm getting is when people first feel the grace of god i i've experienced myself and then you kind of feel like something's there with you helping you holding your hand and all of a sudden you're yeah. alone you're like what's going on here do you want me to sing <laughs> yeah, okay yeah, i'm gonna yeah. sing you know and then you start getting upset <laughs> you don't know what to do and when i heard you tell yeah. that story it was so Saint Paisios, if I can say it that way. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, absolutely, it was, it was absolutely. Different. Yeah, it's a it's a great story because we all we all have that situation you're talking about where we feel like we're helped. We got our training wheels on, you know, and then all of a sudden, the kind of the carpets pulled out from under us. We feel like we're alone or abandoned, or and we're calling out like David. You know, where are you? How long will you be away from me? These kinds of things, and um. 
So St. Paisios has this wonderful story to help remedy this. And it's, like you said, it's so in his character um, because it's so simple. And he said, he said that when he plants his tomato plants, he, um, he waters them every day. He cares for them. He even moves them from one uh, window to the next. And he's saying this story to a man who asked him, why do I feel like the grace of God has abandoned me or left me? Um, or why do I feel in, in uninspired or things like this? Um, or why is God so close? And then sometimes he's not. It's, it's something around those lines is like the question. And so Sam Pacis is telling him about these tomatoes and how he cares for them so much. He nurtures them so much. He's always caring for them. He's joyful for when they sprout, he talks about, right? And, but he says, there's like this turning point where he says, when they um, reach the age that I, and I'm going to put them outside, he said, I put them outside and then I neglect them. So I don't water them. I just walked past them. I ignore them, you know, these kinds of things. And he said, right when they're about to, they're, they're wilting and right when they're about to, to die, then he starts to water them again and care for them again and give them the, give them the same kind of uh, treatment they got when they were inside, when they were just seeds and, and, and little sprouts. Um, and the reason why he said this, he said, the reason why I do that is because they start to grow deeper, the roots start to grow deeper and search for water. So that when I water them again, I fertilize them again, they'll they'll bear more fruit than they would have if I just continued to baby them all of the time, you know. And so um, the whole lesson was that the Lord allows us to have these periods where we feel, of course, we're not alone ever, right? Um, but where we feel like we're struggling a little bit more or a little bit more on our own, Um and there's a temptation for us to kind of despair or to begin to entertain the idea that God's grace has abandoned us or that there's no hope for us or um, things like this, you know, along this line of thinking. But the Lord is actually doing us a great favor and he's allowing us to struggle a little bit more um, to try to get our roots a little bit deeper. So that when the, the grace does come um, and rest on us again, that we'll be able to bear more fruit, right? Um, and so it's a great story because it helps us in times where we might think that we're alone or think, or think that we're um, too weak to do something or whatever. It gives us a little motivation, you know? I guess you can also say that you know, with a child, if you give them everything they want their entire life, then they'll never actually grow to appreciate it, you know? Yeah. And that's how we are, you know, and the Lord knows that. And so if he were to nurture and baby us our entire life, there was no struggle. We wouldn't really grow to appreciate the grace of God in our life. But when there is some struggle and there's some effort to get something, to attain something, then at the end, when we've attained it, um, we have a great appreciation and a love uh, for God's presence in our life. So, you know, St. Joseph said, no, nobody gets, St. Joseph the Hezekiah says, nobody gets to heaven sitting in an armchair. Yeah. Or if, yeah. if there, he said, if there were no temptations, nobody would be saved, is what he says. Yeah. I love that one. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think St. Anthony says something along those lines too. But, um, so, so when, when these temptations come in our life, when we feel overwhelmed, um, don't lose spirit, be, be courageous in your struggle and, and fight to seek out that water, you know, um, because the Lord will water us again. We have to be ready to bear um, more fruit and to multiply our talent given to us. Oh, that was beautiful. Um, as you were saying that, uh, it reminded me of my grandfather, who even when I was talking to Father Turbo, he came up as, as well. So it's funny. It just mm -hmm. popped in my, my head because my dad told me a story when he went back to Cyprus uh, not too long ago. He noticed that uh, that the tree roots were up higher to the ground. He could see them. And he would say, mm -hmm. he says, they're over, they're over watering them. 
and, and I was like, what do you mean? And it's like, well, because they're overwatering them. The roots don't have to dig as deep. Oh, and it was almost uh -huh. like, yeah. So he, yeah. as you were saying that, I was like, that popped in my mind. Like, oh, wait, my grandfather was taught, like, that's what he taught us. Like, well, through my father, uh, you know, uh -huh, that, uh -huh. that idea. And it's true. It's true. Uh, the the yeah. roots, you could see them. And, and you, that's a really, uh, what a beautiful story. St. Paisios always has these, these ways of kind of connecting with you on a simple, like complicated issues in a simple way. It's, it's Absolutely. Like, there's no better way of putting it. It's like, he's, Absolutely. He's and you also mentioned St. Joseph the Hesychist, one of my favorites. Um, he also has a little bit more darker approach, if I could say that. I don't know if I'm allowed to say something like that, but his approach seems a bit darker. He, he seemed a little bit more struggled. But uh, Yeah, I, he, I mean, he had to. The thing is, is like he had to fight for it. You know, yeah. like like real had to fight. When, when he went to Athos, it was a time of spiritual decline on Athos. And so uh -huh. he had no like spiritual, he had no real constant spiritual father in his life. Uh, there was no like great big monastery that had all of this kind of monastic, um, hesychistic tradition and it didn't exist at his time. And so he really had to give up. And, you know, in the, in the um, biography, there's a part in the biography of, you know, Elder Frem's kind of autobiography of him going to Athos and seeing him. And St. Joseph says something to him, like uh, along the lines of, you guys are so lucky. Like you, 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 you don't know what we fought for before you came here. You just came here and you already have a brotherhood and an elder and da, 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 da. But when we came here, when he talked about him and his spiritual brother, Elder Arsenios, when we came here, we had nothing, you know, and we had to build it for you basically. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think that's why is because he had this, he had to have this warrior mentality mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. um, you know, he, he had the armor up all of the time and things like that. And, but I think this is the beautiful thing about the church too, is that different personalities are sanctified. You know, the Lord doesn't just, um, delete a person's personality and turn them into nothingness or like program them like robots to all be the same. They have these personalities that are so wonderful and there's a lady who goes to our church, um, an older Greek lady, and she actually she's German, but she was raised in Greece, and she knew Saint Porphyrios and Saint Iakovos oh. and Saint Paisios. Oh, yeah. uh, she knew all yeah. three, and she said every one of them was different. You know, yeah. like like Porphyrios was like an old grandpa, like always with joy <laughs> when you're around him. Um, Saint Paisios was always very stern, like told people like how it is uh she said and and saint yakovos was always just smiling and radiating um with joy so every every personality is different and it's wonderful because it gives us such a wide a wide variety of flavors of the spiritual life but yet at the same time they're all the same spiritual spiritually nourishing food yeah, that's that's a good way of putting it. Actually, all three uh, that you just mentioned, all three saints. I was watching um, uh, Metro Met Metropolitan Neophytos from Morfu talking mm -hmm. about meeting all three, and I, I love hearing him. I'm I'm, I'm lucky and, and and blessed enough to understand Greek, so I can I can hear yeah. the freshness of his of his uh, of his words. He's very poetic mm -hmm. when he speaks, mm -hmm. and he, when he's describing meeting all three uh, and just uh, the the description that he gives it's you can see he's like a little boy he's like gleefully telling you these stories of like meeting these <laughs> heroes it, it, it gets me excited and uh it also yeah. it is the beauty of of the faith um that even my nephew um <clears throat> he's uh he's uh he was born roman catholic and now he's you know looking towards our our direction he's looking for a spiritual father um to to become a catechumen and all that and go through the process mm -hmm. and uh one of the things he mentioned <clears throat> that he noticed about uh about uh eastern orthodox priests like yourself and everyone else they're all real people like he, he was like he's like one guy's talking about punk rock the other guy's lifting heavy weights the other guy's like, and, I was like, and i never really thought about them I'm like yeah that's true because he came from a roman catholic background which is not yeah. like that and and i think yeah. that is a beauty of of what uh what we have is uh all, all of you guys, like, if I could say it that way, and I, I apologize if I'm saying that incorrectly. I'm still not sure exactly how to, how to make reference no, to these thank things. God, thank God, but thank God. Every, yeah. Everyone's um, 
like a normal person. You can relate with 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 a priest. You can walk up and he's like, you guys can ask them questions. I'm like, yeah, why you, you couldn't ask them questions? He's like, not, <laughs> not like not the way you you're talking to them. You can't talk to them like that. I'm like, was it always like that? I'm like, yeah, because I remember when I was a kid, I'd go to Cyprus or whatever. Yeah. I would ask him, why do you why do you have long hair? You know, like I would walk up to the yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> And yeah, I, yeah. I, think I, I took that for granted. I took that for mm. granted. Mm. But uh, mm. I, I really want to thank you so very much for your time. Uh, if there's any final words you have, and of course, please uh, tell everybody about about Death to the World or anything you got coming up or anything you want to plug. Uh, and uh, I'm sorry we didn't talk enough about that. There was so much to talk no, about. No, I know it's okay. It's okay. It's, it's okay. It's okay. Um, well, you know, just as a final thing, just for everybody it's lent you know um and lent is when what many fathers uh, coin as the purple demons come out during lent and so s struggle sometimes is a little bit more difficult um but it it's it's the it, it it at the same time is a blessing because it reveals um various aspects of our life that need to change and to be swept up and cleaned right in order to receive christ on holy pascha and so just struggle on and and uh and endure it endure the struggle and and as much as you can wherever you're at to be close to a church or to be praying the 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 prayers of the church um but but yeah like we were talking about in the beginning this debt to the world ministry that helped me come to the church it's still going on um that I help run and we have, we still have magazines. You can just go to deathoftheworld.com. It's pretty, uh, pretty easy to remember. There's, um, there's various branches that have come off of it, like the Ethnic Run podcast, which is basically just the teachings that we're doing um, at the parish here locally. And then um, there's a Patreon too on there and some various other things that um, we have like on, on social media if you have that and things like that but um but yeah please reach out anytime you'd like and uh, feel free to grab any magazines or things like that from the website well i'll absolutely uh, include all that and uh i really want to thank you from the bottom of my heart father thank you for doing this this was quite a quite a delight for me i, I really appreciate it and you helped me a lot thank god, uh, understanding things. Thank god. it was wonderful to it was wonderful to um to be with you on here and everything you. do you have a you you mentioned something you don't have a parish really where you're at or is that no a I, it's a thing and it's uh i'm trying to figure this out uh mm -hmm. I, as uh as it so seems uh all of the orthodox churches are on the other side of mexico uh oh. which uh, traveling in mexico isn't so easy so when you say 24 right. hours it's not like you could just jump in a car and go it, it's, it's right. quite a challenge uh, right. So it's on the other side. Although there are plans to build a monastery really close to where I'm at, but oh, uh, interesting. Yeah, but it's Mexico, right? So it's just a plan. You know what I mean? <laughs> what I mean? Yeah, 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 yeah. So I've I've, yeah. I've been reaching out and trying to let them know, like, hey, there's a few of us here, uh, like because of the podcast and a few things. A few friends have reached out. I've actually made mm -hmm. a few friends in Mexico through groups. Uh, one uh, one amazing uh, connection I've made. He's on the other side now. He just moved to another part of Mexico just to become a catechumen. Yeah. Um, so I'm I'm trying to see what I could do over here. But yeah, I don't have an actual church to go to. It's yeah. funny when I was in Toronto, I literally there was you named the denomination. It was two minutes away from my house, and uh, yeah. I didn't go. I didn't go. And I come here, and then I start taking this path and i desperately want to take communion go go to divine liturgy and i just it's it's funny <laughs> yeah know, you're isolated funny. a bit well i well, may god may god grant it because there you know the there needs to be more mission work in mexico yes yes you know? absolutely it, and, and actually and, uh we need to do it here in the United States too. You know, unfortunately, I, I have a I have a Spanish background, but my grandfather never taught my father because he wanted him to be Amer American. You know, right? So I never learned it, and I always regret that. I wish I wish that I did know more Spanish to do more Spanish in our services because we have a lot of um, um, people from Mexico, different parts. It's funny, like I never lived in a part of California that has like 
different Mexican food. Like we have a Sinaloa yeah. place, we have a oh, Mechocan yeah. place, we have yeah. like these people from Chihuahua. We have all these different kinds of Mexican food, a variety. It's it's kind of funny, but um, yeah, there needs to be more outreach for sure. And I'm I'm definitely pointing the finger at myself when I say that. <laughs> too. Well, well, I'm I'm I wanted to. I have. I don't know if I should say it on here, but I do have uh, a plan that I would like to actually start uh, doing that because I have to say something about the Mexican people. And if anyone is, is in Mexico and please reach out, they're incredible, incredible. The culture is incredible. The people are incredible. And a lot of them have not even heard of orthodoxy at all. Yeah. Um, and there are some uh, ch churches, like I said, on the other side of Mexico, but I'll tell you what, um, there was a, there's a particular friend that I have here that I've made here. And he um, and I, we talked a lot about spirituality stuff before orthodoxy. And mm. then uh, he was at my house the other day and he had seen the Father Turbo uh, interview that I did, but he mm -hmm. saw the interview. I, th I thought, okay, like, did he really? And then he starts, we start talking and then he's saying things and I'm like, uh, have you been looking in? to orthodoxy or whatever he's like yeah. well i watched uh, the episode you did with father turbo and i was like <laughs> okay okay so then he started he started he and i was like blown away i was like this guy was asking questions um the thing about mm. uh, mexicans is um they're either extremely roman catholic uh, or they have like a mix of the of Roman Catholicism mixed with like um, indigenous uh, yeah. faith. Like they kind of t intertwine it, or they're yeah. like of the old, like you know the whole Gaia worship and all that. But when they mm -hmm. encounter Orthodoxy, sorry if I'm I'm going off here. I just because no I no please 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 it's fascinating. So speaking to Mexicans directly and and like even trying to communicate with my horrible Spanish, uh, uh, I could see when I present them with a different approach to rethinking how they view Christianity. It's something they've mm -hmm. never encountered before. Uh, when mm -hmm. I remove the judgment aspect of it, because that's something we talked about with Father Turbo, the, it's either the uh, the Ned Flanders, I called it the Ned Flanders approach, you know, the Protestant approach, or there's like the... Yeah, yeah. the judgy you're going to hell approach of, of the catholics yeah. when i started referring yeah. to to it as a hospital and all that through the words of father turbo like from using father turbo's mm -hmm. interview to kind of do that you saw them kind of go oh okay so you're not judging like in the way that a catholic would judge i was like no not at all we're all sick like we're sick i'm sick you're sick we're sick mm -hmm. and, you know and uh you could see something click you know, you could really see something click. And I do believe strongly uh, from like, I would say seven Mexicans I've spoken to directly. Um, they want to know more. And That's uh, wonderful. I know that there's a death to the world uh, Spanish. There was. On there Instagram, is. Yeah. It went away. Where did, what happened to it? It went away. Oh, I don't know. I don't know. It, you know, it was it was some guys that called me um, yeah. and they just asked, can we do this? And I said, yeah, you know, translate whatever you want to Spanish. I wonder if something happened. Um, I think that I do somewhere. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, so they I'd disappeared. Like to find out more. Okay. Yeah. That's, well, I, was, that's I was looking at for it today because I, I was doing some research on this and I saw them and I, I'd been following them on Instagram and then I went to go mm -hmm. look for them, but that was only yesterday. I did a quick search on Instagram and I couldn't find them. Okay. I think it was like death to the world, Espanol, I think something like that. Yeah. And I yeah. It actually might them. try the name in Spanish. Okay. Okay. Yeah, they might be. Yeah, okay. yeah. So, okay, like Muerto Mondo or something like that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly, exactly. Oh, let, me, let me plug this in my my laptop's gonna die. Okay, Father, uh, I've taken enough of, of your time. Thank you so very much for everything. Um, and uh, yeah, hopefully we'll we'll talk again. Okay, God bless you. God bless you. I hope so. Stay in touch. Bored no more. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>